in our system, we now have uh, two digital projectors. This white dot right here uh, is a very large one. It's basically an IMAX projector. It's got a special lens on it so that it can get it's more curved than the dome. Uh, there is a matching one, I should say, in half the dome. So there's a matching one in the back of the room, and then back behind there's another white dot. Uh, those two projectors together give us the images that we are seeing. But because they are digital projectors, they can do a lot more. And so we opened, a few months ago, we opened a new show called Turtle Odyssey. And that's a live action documentary about uh, Australian sea turtles, right? So it's not necessarily about astronomy. We can do a lot of other things. And if you're interested in stuff like that, then grab a brochure on your way out, and they'll show you all the different shows that we have on offer. But we are still a planetarium. Uh, which means that at least once a day, I think, we should come in here and talk about what you could expect to see in the night sky. And so that's what this show is. For the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to talk about what is in the sky right now and how do we actually go about finding it. In most cases, I'm going to focus on things that you can see without the help of a telescope, but there will be a few things uh, that telescopes will be needed for. I try and focus on things that you don't have to have a telescope for because most people don't have a telescope at home. Okay. Without further ado, let's get started. We need to know two things. If we're going to start doing our own star observing in our backyards, we need to get really good at knowing two things. The first thing is you need to know what time it is. Uh, that should be pretty obvious. If you go outside right now, it's not very dark, and you're, gonna, you're not going to see a whole lot. But more than that, uh, you spend your life uh, on a giant spinning ball. Right? We don't think about that much, but that's reality. Our entire lives are spin on a gigantic spinning ball that is constantly turning. And as it turns, it moves your position in space constantly. And what that makes it look like is over time, it looks like everything in the sky moves, right? It's not just the sun that rises in the east. Everything in the sky appears to rise in the east. Because again, what you're actually watching here is you're watching the rotation of the Earth and you're going along for the ride, right? You're, you're, go, you're turning through space and your perspective changes. So the, another reason that time is important is because the constellations that are going to be up overhead at 10 p.m. are different from the ones that are up at 2 a.m. So make sure that you know what time you need to go out. Most of this afternoon show is gonna focus around 10 p.m. because that's late enough that it's pretty dark, but it's not so late that you have to be miserable trying to stay up to make it to that hour, right? Um, so for example, uh, Orion the Hunter over here is setting around 11.30 or midnight. If you go outside much later than that, you won't be seeing Orion uh, this time of year anymore. You've got to go out fairly early. And that brings us to the second thing that we need to know. So we need to know what time it is. We also need to know what direction we're facing when we're looking at the stars. That's very, very helpful. So we're gonna get good today at finding our own cardinal directions. Uh, in here, to start with, uh, we're gonna cheat. Right? I've got these big red letters. Nature isn't so kind. The horizon doesn't actually have big red letters. But in here, for a moment, we can cheat, and we'll figure out how to find these for ourselves by the end of the show. We are currently facing south, which puts east on our left, west is over there on our right, and north then is back behind us. So Orion, being low in the western sky means that, again, as the, as the sky appears to move, he's not long for this world. He's going to set below the horizon over there in the west. He's what's called a winter constellation. Let's talk about why we call certain constellations winter constellations. We have constellations like Leo the Lion is considered the harbinger of springtime. He's among the first of the spring constellations. This is uh, this backwards question mark is what you're looking for in the springtime, very high in the south. He's got his front paw here. He's got his body right here. His back legs are right here. Leo is one of those constellations that actually kind of looks like what it's supposed to. When you find Leo, it kind of looks like a lion up there in the sky. If you play Connect the Dots, you can kind of see like the side-on view of a lion in the sky. So this is how we find Leo. Actually, the way, so if you, if you struggle with finding Leo, because again, right now, uh, in the spring, this backwards question mark is really high in the south. It's actually pretty easy to spot. Sometimes that's not the case. Other times of the year, it's a little tougher. But you can always find the Big Dipper, and the pot of the Big Dipper is always trying to smack Leo on the back of the head. You know, take it down like that. And you've got Leo in the sky. 
Uh -huh. ¿Qué dice so, Leo es una spring constellation. Uh, 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 Why does this happen? Over, over the course of a year, constellations have this slow drift to the west. We're not talking just a few minutes, right? We do have this daily motion as well, right? As time marches on, the, the earth turns, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but for instance, actually, let me just make this really clear. Okay, this is today. Wednesday, April 7th. Okay. If I jump back, if I grab the calendar here, uh, let's see. here and I go back to let's say let me go ahead and put Leo back up there so we can see him and we'll go ahead and put Orion up there as well so we'll make this really nice and obvious so if I jump back to say January right right now we're in April it's April 7th if I just we just make a sudden jump to January 7th uh, same really? time 11 p.m. the time has not changed all we do is we went three months back in history and now Orion is here at 11 p.m. Whereas in April, Leo is here at 11 p.m. How does that happen? Why does that change occur? Well, let's take a look at the solar system from someone besides the Earth for a minute here. We're going to zoom out and we're going to take a look at the entire solar system. I'm going to have to do a little bit of program. They recently changed, uh, they added a lot of moons in the solar system. They added uh, wow. uh, high resolution catches, which is really cool if you're looking at that moon. Um, but one of the things it does is when you add those moons, like when you're looking at the entire solar system, wow. uh, it really slows things down. So I'm going to see it. Mira, lindo, como se mueve. Wow, Mercurio, Venus. Wow, Marte. All right. So we are slowly working our way out of the solar system. Here you can see the Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Right? This is the inner solar system. The reason we see, we call it the inner solar system is going to get really obvious here in a moment. Notice that there is a fairly even space Hope in between these two. first four. Right, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars, they're all about the same distance from each other. But then ah, suddenly, so so the next four planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, which is a little bit of We're at a new distance scale. Those first four planets now are really close to the sun when you start comparing them to the second four planets, which we call the outer solar system. These are the gas giants. We do also have Pluto down here, just because this little animation still, uh, still attaches it. Of course, Pluto was kicked out of our little club about 15 years ago or so. If you're still holding on to that, right, let it tie. It's been quite a while. Uh, if you, uh, but just very briefly here, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but if you're still a big fan of Pluto and you think it's silly that they kicked it out because it's too small, uh, well, you're not alone because the real reason, the reason it was reported on, right, if you watch like national news and things, it was just that Pluto's too small to be a planet. It's all we ever heard. Pluto's too small to be a planet. Um, we found Pluto in 1930, and it didn't take us 76 years to figure out how small Pluto was. Right? Like, it wasn't news in 2006. They're like, oh, Pluto's a small little thing. It shouldn't be a planet, right? So probably something else actually happened that caused this new category to be formed. And basically what happened was a lot of new telescopes were coming online at that same time frame. In the early 2000s, there were a lot of telescopes on a mountain in Hawaii called Mauna Kea. That's the name of the mountain down there. Uh, they built a lot of big new telescopes and they started finding things that we didn't know about before. And so in 2003, we found Haumea, which is about half the size of Pluto. Haumea just came on over here. Uh, and then in 2004, we found Maki Maki, uh, which is about two-thirds the size of Pluto. Uh, and then in 2006, a telescope in Chile, not the one in Hawaii, but a telescope down in Chile in South America, found this thing called Eris. And Eris is actually ever, ever, ever so slightly bigger than Pluto. And so this is kind of the start of this issue. In 2006, we find this thing, and before, when we found Haumea, we found Maki Maki, we just kind of ignored these things, right? They're like half the size, two thirds of Pluto, no problem. But if we are calling Pluto a planet, and now we have something that is basically the exact same size, it's a little bigger, but we're splitting here, so it's basically the exogen. If we have this, then we need to call this a planet. If we don't, we're just playing favorites, right? We just decided we like Pluto, and like we're just gonna stick with it. Uh, Eris is the same size, so we have 10 planets. But if we do that, and the people having this discussion, by the way, they're called the International Astronomical Union, the IAU for short. 
He said, if we do that, then we should probably have a real discussion about, okay, what exactly counts? Because before we started finding this new stuff, it was really obvious. There was just, there were planets and then there was empty space, right? More or less, I mean, there's the asteroid belt as well. But now we're realizing that Pluto is not the only thing out here. And does, if we find something 90% the size of Pluto, does that count? What about 85%, 95? You get the idea. And so they said, well, you know what? All of these things, Pluto included, are actually smaller than Earth's moon, and they really look a bit different from these other things that we're calling planets. So let's make a new category for them. Everything I've listed here, as well as what used to be the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt, he got a promotion of something called a series in between Mars and Jupiter. These five objects are the current dwarf planets in our solar system. It should go without saying that, of course, Pluto has not changed. It's just the reality of doing science is that humans are the ones making these boxes. Right? We, we make up categories to try and understand and explain the world around us and nature. And sometimes as we learn more and more about it, we realize that our categories really don't fit all that well and we need to make new ones. So that's what happened with Pluto. It happens in biology all the time, too. It's just no one ever gets up in arms about it. Uh, like we, Biologists constantly have these discussions about, is this thing we found a new species, or is it just a subspecies of this thing we already know about, right? And there's no clear-cut distinction in a lot of these things that we sort of force on nature. Anyway, that's a digression on Pluto. What started me on this route is I wanted to talk about seasonal constellations. So let's get back to that. This is the Earth. Uh, in addition to rotating once a day, right, we spin around once a day, and we call that day and nighttime, right, 24 hours. We also orbit the sun. Once a year, we start our journey, let's say, here, and then a year goes by, and we slowly work our way all around the sun, and then one year later, we're back where we started. Okay, so let's call this part of or Earth's orbit, I'm just picking this arbitrarily, but let's call this springtime. Now, if we, in springtime, look this direction in the universe, then we see all these stars. It's very pretty. If we, in, in springtime, though, if we look this direction in the universe, Rocky. we don't see these stars. Aprende de eso. Why don't we see these stars? Well, Aprende because what? the sun is in that same direction. So it's All very, very this direction in space is very bright to us in, in April, in, in springtime, because of this, what we call daytime. Anytime you're facing the sun, you call that daytime, right? And when you're facing away from the sun, you call it nighttime. It's pretty straightforward. So these stars still come up in April, but they come up the same time the sun does, so you can't see them. But because we also orbit the sun, every day we're a little bit further along in our orbit, and a little bit further, further and further. And six months from now, in so what is it, September, October, right, we're going to be over here. And now those stars I can see back in March, which remember were this direction, well, now those are the ones blocked by the sun. If I look this way now, now that's when I'm looking for the sun. In October, this direction is daytime, and those stars I couldn't see back in April, well, now those stars are very clear to me. I'm facing away from the sun. And so this is why we have seasonal constellations. It's the stars that are facing away from the sun, depending on where you are in the orbit. Okay. So that's why constellations change over time. This is another example of why planet are so useful, because that's a concept that's really hard to grasp when you're looking up into the night sky, but it's something that's really easy to understand if you can be outside of the solar system looking down in it, which becomes very clear. Let's talk about some of these seasonal constellations. We're back to the we south. We have Orion, constellation. Orion will point you to a lot of things here, and I've got some, some pretty nasty doubling on them. Let me back up. Sometimes my projector will project it slightly different places, and it makes things look a little weird, so I'm just going to back up. Okay, so we have Orion the Hunter here, uh, which we've gone back to like 640. You can see the sun is now in the sky. This is the doubling I'm talking about. We only have one sun. Uh, I don't have to adjust that for the show. Uh, we have Orion's belt here, and it points to Taurus the bull. It always points to Taurus the bull. Again, it'll be lower in the sky at, at 10 p.m. this evening, but it's going to be up there in the west. Taurus the bull, this V shape of stars is Taurus. And another thing they're trying to show you right now, and this is something that isn't always there, uh, is the planet Mars. This right here is a planet in the sky. Now, how do I know that's a planet? Well, for one, I work at a planetarium, right? I do this pretty frequently, so I just I happen to know. But more than that, if you know your constellations, then planets will stick out like sore thumbs. Planets actually get their name from the Greek term planetae, which meant wandering star. 
Without a telescope, which the Greeks didn't have, we only had telescopes for 200 years, if you don't have a telescope, this looks like a bright star on any given night, but if you watch it over time, it kind of seems to shift position. It just kind of gradually goes this way. And nowadays, that makes a lot of sense to us because Mars, just like us, orbits the sun, right? So it has a motion all to itself, and since it is currently orbiting the sun, over time, over the course of a couple of years, Mars takes about two and a half years to orbit, it's going to go all the way, all the way around the sky. It, it orbits, right? If you don't know it's a planet, though, if you don't know it's a world like ours, then it might just look like a star that kind of meanders about, right? And so this is what the Greeks thought. So because of that, if you know your constellations, if there is a bright star where you know there shouldn't be a bright star, then it's very obvious that that's a planet, right? Because I know the constellation of Orion, and I know the constellation of Taurus, and there shouldn't be a bright star in Taurus's horns here. So that tells me, I might not know it's the planet Mars, but I know right away that it's a planet. Now, most of us are not going to spend a whole lot of time memorizing 88 constellations, right? Like, I've made a career out of this for 12 years. It's, uh, like, it's one thing for me to do that. It's another thing for you to go home and do it for yourself, right? That's a, that's a lot of time spent for a pretty small reward. Is there a quicker way to figure out whether or not something is or is not a planet? Well, there is. It's a little bit tougher, uh, but there is a quick and dirty way that you might try. In addition to living on a giant spinning ball, the ball you happen to live on, uh, has something we call the atmosphere. And let me go ahead and get rid of the sun here. I need the sun to be set for this. There we go. Okay. We have something called the atmosphere, right? We live in a fluid. In, term, in physics terms, we live in a fluid, right? You know, it's not a liquid. There's a difference in physics there's a difference between a liquid and a fluid. Gases are also fluids. We, we are inside of the atmosphere right now. This is another thing we ignore most of the time. But you are breathing it in, you have been since the start of the, well, since you were born, but since the start of the show, and you're moving through it constantly. It's invisible to us, invisible light. Uh, it really makes very little difference. You can kind of see right through it. But it does actually impact the way light behaves a little bit. When starlight hits the atmosphere of the Earth, depending on the temperature <laughs> of that air and the water content, the humidity of that air, it can act like a lens. Just like a magnifying glass can bend light, and you can like burn on strips of paper and stuff, which kids you shouldn't do unless your parents are there, in which case you know it's their fault. So, um, so you can you can bend light with a magnifying glass. You can also do it just with air. It's very very slight. But as the as the light from the star moves down through the atmosphere of the Earth, uh, it bends back and forth. Uh, look at this star right here. You'll notice that now that I have the atmosphere on that star, is doing something that we often call twinkling. Stars have this little flicker to them. And that's actually caused, stars don't do that up there in space. This is actually why we put space telescopes out there. Like the whole reason for wanting a telescope out in space is to get out of the air of the Earth because it causes so much problems when you're trying to look at things out there in space. It's what causes that sort of back and forth flicker. So stars twinkle. But as you look at, this is, again, sorry to tell them, but this right here is Mars. If you look very closely at both of those planets right there, you'll notice that that is not twinkling. There's no flicker to the planet Mars. There is flicker down here to Aldebaran and the bright star to Taurus. There is none to Mars. So if you want the sort of the quick and dirty way to figure out if you're looking at a planet, watch it for a moment. You think it's a bright star, maybe it's a planet, you're not sure. Watch it for just a moment. And if it doesn't flicker, there's a very good chance that you have found a planet, right? That's a, good, that's a, a way you don't have to memorize your constellation. Okay. Uh, if you're not aware, by the way, we just last month, we landed another rover on Mars. It's called Perseverance. It's got a lot of really cool stuff that it's working on. Uh, one of the things, and it's going to be soon, actually, it might be there tomorrow. I need to look into that. Uh, it has its own little drone, like a helicopter drone, that it's dropping under the surface, and it's going to try and take flight. Um, because that's something that we really don't know if that's part. We've never flown in terms of aerial flight on another planet. We've always used rockets, right? That's how we land in things, that's how we've gotten there, we use rockets. Mars has an atmosphere, but it's a much, much thinner atmosphere than the Earth. So there's this kind of question, this kind of fun. Uh, could you uh, generate enough lift with a drone on the surface of Mars to actually take off just on your aerial flight? There's a lot of other cool things that's working on as well, but that's one of the things Perseverance is trying. Uh, let's take Orion Belt. 
Which, by the way, Orion the Hunter, this is his belt, this is his sword, this are his knees down here, his shoulders up here, Taurus the Bull we talked about. If you take his belt, you find Taurus the Bull, don't stop because you can also really enjoy the Pleiades Star Cluster. The Pleiades Star Cluster is something you don't have to have a telescope for. If you happen to have binoculars at home, you don't have to have a telescope for everything. Sometimes binoculars are just fine, and the Pleiades is a great example of that. Uh, because in 50 times magnification, you can really see quite a bit of detail in the Pleiades star cluster. Uh, I call this a cluster, by the way, because these stars are physically close to each other out there in space. It might sound like, like uh, you know, kind of redundant, like, look, they're right next to each other. But remember that a lot of stars that look like they're right next to each other, like Orion's belt, are not actually right next to each other. Remember, the sky is, the, we're, we're going to really drive this home right at the end of the show, but the sky is three-dimensional. It looks two-dimensional to us. It looks like this star is next to this one is next to this one. No but if you flew that direction, you would, you would get to one of those stars a lot sooner than the other two because there is a different distance to them. It's this optical illusion. They line up well from the perspective of the Earth, but there's different distances. These stars are actually close to one another. So we call them the star cluster. They're all gravitationally bound. They're moving through space together. And the thing about the Pleiades star cluster that makes them extra pretty is they also happen to be moving through a diffuse cloud of gas, which gives these stars this sort of ghostly glow, this haze that they seem to have, is because the starlight from those stars is shining through uh, a cloud of gas. It just kind of adds to the beauty of the Pleiades star cluster. You can pick those out low in the west because you think you got early enough. Uh, in addition, if you do happen, so here's something, well, before I go, we did a binoculars thing, let's, I got a telescope thing coming, how about we do a, a, an unaided eye thing first. We take his belt, we find Taurus, we find the Pleiades, great. The other way, you can't go wrong, if you go the other way in the night sky, you'll find what is the brightest star besides the sun. This right here, as seen from the Earth, is the brightest star in the night sky. We call it Sirius. Uh, it's also known as the dog star because it's in the constellation of Canis Major, which is Latin for big dog. That's his head. This is his shiny collar. Uh, his front legs are here. His body comes back here. His back legs are here. To me, it kind of looks like a dachshund. Uh, and his wackly tail is right here. Uh, Canis Major is a little bit tougher to see than things like Orion uh, or Leo. But again, if you, kind of, if you have your, uh, an imagination, you can kind of see that, yeah, that does kind of look like a dog. Uh, in the sky, Candace Major, one of Orion's two hunting dogs, Candace Minor, the little dog being the other one, and it's actually these two stars, that entire constellation, the little dog, Candace Minor, is just those two stars. We like to say that if Candace Minor is any kind of dog in the sky, uh, it's a hot dog. So you can use your imagination to pick out the hot dog in the sky as well. Uh, okay, so some people believe that the, the brightest star in the sky is the North Star. Right, the brightest star in the night sky is the North Star. And take, just take a moment here to appreciate that, that is, like, that's an easy way to get lost. Right? We are not facing, this is the brightest star in the night sky. That's not the way to find the North Star. Okay? We'll talk about how to find the North Star here in just a moment. Uh, okay, now for the telescope bit. So we've got Orion's belt, his sword. Uh, so not this, uh, this is just a star. The middle dot in the, in the belt of Orion is just a star. But the middle dot in his sword is more than just a star. Even a backyard telescope can pick out a little bit of detail uh, in the Great Orion Nebula. Now I'm going to show you a picture here from the, the Hubble telescope, so don't expect this view. This would be spectacular, um, and you should donate your telescope to my friends here if you see this in your backyard. Uh, but you can, just a, a few weeks ago, I had a skeleton down here, and we saw the Orion Nebula for ourselves. Uh, in our eyes, it was green. Uh, because this is a false color image, and so some of these colors are okay. like purples and the reds and the blues uh, oh my God. are infrared light or gamma ray light, uh, so you don't actually wow, see yeah. those. Some people think, okay, so that's fake light. Uh, that's not really the case. Uh, so you can see a very narrow band. Uh, and other, we've had to invent other instruments to take other way to the light. And so that's what we're seeing. Uh, positive image. Actually, from several different telescopes. Uh, this is from the Hubble Space Telescope. This is from the Spitzer and Chandra. Two other space observatories that aren't quite as famous because of the light. It was the X-ray and the infrared. And so again, to your eyes, it mostly, at least to my eyes, it mostly looks great. You can get some of these colors if you start doing some of your own photography. Um, cameras can pick up some of these blues and purples. But again, to me, it's 
Pero después, a las cuatro y media, hay uno de tortuga. Let's start talking just briefly here about the springtime sky. And the springtime sky is actually a little bit trickier to find than some of the winter stars. The winter stars are all pretty obvious because of Orion and the hunter. Um, Leo the lion, we are talking about, is fairly easy. But a lot of the other spring constellations are a little bit trickier to find. I'll point them out to you right now, and then I'll talk about no, pero que depende porque tenemos que el otro show a las cuatro y media. Si esto se termina antes, venimos a ver si hay un store. Se me olvidó el rey blanco. Tiene la suerte de los candidatos acá. But if you look for like the bottom of a cone and then the top, like the scoop of ice cream there, you can kind of find that. Uh, the bright star in that is called Arcturus, and that's actually going to turn out to be pretty handy in trying to find uh, Buetes. We also have Virgo the Maiden over here in the east. This is another spring constellation. This, is, this one's tough just because of the size of it. Virgo is actually a very large constellation. It takes up a big chunk of the eastern sky over there. Uh, and so... It can be tough to find uh, in, in uh, things kind of shrink in the planetarium. I mean, the real sky it really is very, very quite large. Um, and so, finding starting by finding Spica is the way that you might try and find Virgo, which again I'll come back to. And then finally, in this same kind of line, we have a little trapezoid down here. Corvus the Crow is the last of the spring constellations. Now, if you really want to find the spring constellations, uh, the Big Dipper is your best friend. The Big Dipper is going to help us find not only the spring constellations, but also the North Star. So what we're going to do at this point is we're going to turn around and we're going to face north together, and we're going to see if we can't find the Big Dipper. Now, I know early in the show I kind of gave it away already, that uh, kind of the, I showed you briefly the position of the Big Dipper, but I'm, I'm going to lay off my laser pointer here for just a moment and see if you can find La the Big Dipper. The constellation If you do start doing Esto your own observing, your own stargate, uh, then, then this is a great place to start, for one reason, because the Big Dipper is actually always in your sky. Now, it is a pretty obvious pattern as well, so that's helpful, but the big thing is that no matter when you go outside, If you go outside at 10 p.m. or 4 a.m. or January or July, you guarantee that you can find the Big Dipper. Now, this is only true in certain parts of the world. So if you go down to Texas or down towards the equator, it's not necessarily always true anymore. But here in Michigan, you can actually always find the Big Dipper. So we're going to start with that. Look for seven stars. If you think you found it, count the stars. There should be seven of them. This time of year, it is pretty high in the northeast. Uh, and so again, we turned around, so now the east is on your right. It's actually kind of directly over my clock. It wouldn't hold a whole lot of water right now because it's kind of upside down. Uh, hopefully, we have spotted this thing right here. The Big Dipper uh, is in the sky. This actually is not doubling. This is not a problem with my system. See how there's kind of like two stars there? That's an actual optical double. If you go outside, you look very closely at the North Star, or sorry, at the Big Dipper, and the, the star that's in kind of the middle of the handle, if you look very closely at that star, you'll actually see that there are two there. It's called Alcor and Mizar. Uh, it used to be a test for good eyesight. If you could tell that there were two stars there just by looking with your eyes, um, then you still had very good eyes. You weren't too old yet, because uh, once you got old enough, those kind of blended together into one star. Okay, Big Dipper. So there's an old saying in astronomy. You take the Big Dipper, you take the handle of the Big Dipper, and you can arc to Arcturus. Right? You arc to Arcturus. So you follow the arcing path of the handle, and the bright star you come to is Arcturus. And if you continue along that path, the Big Dipper is trying to show you, which again right now is over my head, so my laser won't be able to go there. Um, but we've got the Big Dipper, you arc to our torso, and then you spike to Spica. If you just kind of keep going that way, you'll find the star Spica. And that's very helpful for learning your springtime constellations. Okay. Now the real reason the Big Dipper is so important is because it also points us to the North Star. The handle is used for that. spring, but now we're going to ignore that. We don't care about the handle. It's these other two stars that we really want to focus on, the two not attached to the handle at all. They're going to point you right to the North Star. That's how you find the North Star. You don't look for the brightest thing, because again, you look around, right? Capella is quite a bit brighter. The Gemini twins, Pollux and Castor, are quite a bit brighter than the North Star. So don't look for the brightest thing. It's a fairly bright star. But the Big Dipper is what will show you where it is. Okay. 
So what's the big deal? If it's not the brightest star in the night sky, why is the North Star so important? Because, look, there are a lot of other stars that are pretty well due north. If I'm just sailing, like, they've got a lot of them low down here, the ocean is not going to be a problem on my horizon. I'm not going to crick my neck to look this high. I'm going to follow one of these stars down here, due north. What, why is this the North Star as opposed to a North Star? Well, I started this show by telling you that you live, it's, easy, it's so easy to forget, but you live on a giant spinning ball, right? And so the sky has this constant motion to it. And there are a lot of stars, a lot of stars that are north sometimes, but you can't trust them. They're not going to stay there. Over time, their position appears to shift. But notice that that is not the case for this particular star. We can make this really obvious here in the planetarium. Let me get the Big Dipper up there because I, I want to talk about that here in a moment. Uh, by just keeping track of the motion of these things, if we just start uh, sort of drawing all the positions of these stars. Mmm, qué lindo. <laughs> wow, qué bonito. Okay. So now it becomes obvious that things are rising in the east, they are moving over the course of time, they are setting in the west, but this one right here had no apparent motion to it because just like the finger on a spinning basketball does not seem to move as the rest of the basketball spins around and around, well, the, the axis of the Earth's rotation, i.e. that spinning finger, right, or the finger at the bottom, is pointing